would you feel if the leader of your country had become your enemy and unjustly wanted to kill you? In fact, 3,000 assassins were hired to do the job. More than that, what would you do if you had the opportunity to kill that leader and so guarantee your survival? Wouldn't that be justified? In the series, Issues of the Heart, Charles Price shows how David was faced with this very scenario, but was still able to listen to his conscience and spare King Saul. What do you do when you want to take the law into your own hands? How conscientious is your heart? If you got your Bible, I'm going to read from 1 Samuel chapter 19, first of all. And we have been talking about David for a few weeks, so it's a number of weeks back into our history now. You've probably forgotten. Looking at David and God's dealings with him under the overall theme, Issues of the Heart. You may remember last time we left David, he was a teenage boy who had secured a great victory for Israel over the Philistines by his slaying of Goliath. The Philistine giant had intimidated Israel, you remember, for 40 years. Israel was in battle with the Philistines. Their king was Saul. No one dared step out of the Israelite army and say, I'm going to take him on. Not even Saul, who was the king of Israel and who was the obvious choice because he's described as being head and shoulders above everybody else. So at least he could look Goliath in the chest. (laughs) Goliath was big, tall, strong. But not only was Saul the biggest man they had, but God had said to the prophet Samuel when Saul became king, anoint him leader of my people, Israel. He will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. God's stated intent for Saul as king was that he would deliver Israel from the Philistines. Well, here's a golden opportunity. One of three golden opportunities given to Saul. This is Saul's opportunity to trust that God is as good as his word and what he promised he will bring about. But instead of faith, Saul is characterized by fear. Instead of trust, Saul is characterized by terror. Instead of obedience, Saul is characterized by oppression. And instead of operating by the Spirit of God, which he'd been invited to do, he's operating only by human resources, by human ingenuity, and by human wisdom. And none of that was a match for the Philistine Goliath. This was the stale mate, had gone on for 40 days. Then along came David. You remember we talked about this last time. He brought some bread and some cheese and some barley for his brothers who were in the battle. David himself was too young. He was back home looking after his father's sheep. When he came with this uh, food for his brothers, he saw the dilemma. And to cut the story very short, because we talked about it last time, in chapter 17 and verse 32, David went to Saul. He said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant, that's me, your servant will go and fight him. And Saul said to him, that's impossible. You're just a boy. He's been a fighting man from his youth. He will turn you to mincemeat. David said this, the Lord will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Now to Saul, that was pious, spiritual gobbledygook. That kind of thing is okay to sing about in church on Sunday or talk about when you're in a safe Christian environment, but that has no relevance to life when you're in conflict and battle and trouble on Monday. That's just Sunday escapism. As in fact so much a pious spiritual talk is. But David had already proved the sufficiency of God in lesser circumstances, in private, with no audience to applaud him, When on the hillside with his sheep, a bear came 
And David attacked and killed the bear, and then a lion came, and David attacked and killed the lion. And he said to Saul, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistines. See, Saul had no hinterland of experience of seeing God at work, whereas David did. And you build your hinterland of experience with God, not in the public domain. No one people are watching. You build it alone and in secret. Because if our only Christian exercise is in community, we can all learn the language, but know nothing of the reality. And so when David said that, Saul responded with what actually was genuine gobbledygook to Saul. He said this. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Now, Saul didn't believe that for a moment. If Saul believed the Lord would have been with David, he would have believed the Lord would have been with him. God himself. This is just jargon. And we can learn spiritual jargon in Sunday school. We can develop our spiritual vocabulary in church. But it has no bearing on the realities of our lives. And this was true for Saul. Just language, jargon. And so David goes with his sling and his five stones, you remember, and he defeats and he kills Goliath. And he liberates the nation of Israel from this Philistine threat. So what happens now? What happens to Saul? Saul has been on the hook. Now he's off. Thank you to David. What do you expect from Saul now? Do you expect him to be full of gratitude to David? David, thank you so, so much. Expect him to be full of praise to David. David, that was an incredible sling of your stone. Man, you really trusted God, didn't you? Now, you don't know human nature if you think that. Saul was filled with anger. The one who should have applauded David hated him the most. And if you go through chapter 18, verse 8, Saul was very angry. That's because the people... The women in particular were singing, Saul has slain his thousands, David is tens of thousands. That didn't help matters very much at all, but they were singing the praises of David. Saul was very angry. Verse 9, from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. 18 verse 15, when Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of David. In chapter 18 verse 29, he was still more afraid, remaining his enemy the rest of his days. Chapter 19 verse 1, Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. And then I read a whole sequence of similar instructions that Saul gave over the next days. Why does Saul want to kill the deliverer of Israel. Why does he want to kill David? Well, when a man should trust God, but doesn't, and somebody else comes along who does trust God, especially if they are younger, he will hate him for it or hate her for it. And they may not understand why. They might not understand why they feel so antagonistic towards that person, why they feel so uncomfortable around that person. Well, in the New Testament, Paul wrote in Galatians 5, verse 17, that the flesh, flesh by definition is my natural self, what I am apart from God, my nature, my natural self. The flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. And that flesh in us, that reliance on our self-sufficiency, expressed in our need to be recognized in our human prowess, the flesh hates the spirit and hates dependence upon the spirit of God and hates his active presence in the lives of those who are trusting him, and they feel very uncomfortable. 
and it becomes anger. They will find every reason to accuse those who live by the Spirit and to criticize them and to dismiss them. Because Saul had deserted his dependence on God, while David demonstrated his dependence on God, David became Saul's enemy and was to spend the next 13 or 14 years as a fugitive on the run with Saul doing all he can during that time to take his life. As I said, he formed a regiment of 3,000 men whose brief was one simple objective, find David and kill him and bring his body back to me. I want to see his dead body. Now, this forms the background to what I want to talk about today. Saul never did manage to kill David, despite the overwhelming odds in his favor. And David knew that Saul would not kill him because God had told him that he would be king. And David believed what God told him. And therefore, to be king, he is not going to die. In fact, he is going to outlive Saul and he's going to succeed him. If it was God who anointed him, as it was, David knew it would be God who would appoint him. What well, God anoints, he appoints. That is, in the course of time, it comes to fruition. Twice, David had the opportunity to kill Saul. And if he could kill Saul, he then would go to the throne, although there would probably be some internal civil war, uh, those from Saul's side, as in fact there was later. He could have killed Saul and take the throne for himself. You know, the person living in dependence on God is totally secure in themselves. David was totally secure in himself. Those who do not depend on God have to shore up their own security. And under the surface, whatever the front that is put on, under the surface, there's a deep sense of insecurity. Because I'm managing my life and I might get it wrong. The second incident was in chapter 26 over the page. And I won't uh, read it to you, but Saul is sleeping in his camp with 3,000 chosen soldiers. They've made camp, and uh, Saul himself is asleep amidst his bodyguards who were also asleep. They became very lax, thinking they were safe. Saul's sword was stuck in the ground next to his head, just parked there, and his water jug was next to him as well. And David and his men were moving by night, and they came across them. This is Saul's army. And again, David's men said to him, this is your opportunity. God has given it to you. Another opportunity to kill Saul. Look at them. They're all sleeping, and his sword is right by his head. Go and take his sword and just kill him. David said no, and with his trusted friend Abishai, they went down to where the soldiers were, stepped over them, came through to where the bodyguards were, who were all sleeping, stepped over them, and quietly took Saul's sword out of the ground and took his water jar and crept back over the soldiers and came back to where they were at a distance from Saul's army on the other side of a valley. And when the morning came and the Saul's army was waking up, David shouted across the valley, do you recognize this sword, anybody? Do you recognize this water jug, anybody? And of course it was Saul's, and he said, I have his sword, I have his water jug, you abysmal bodyguards, I walked right over you, I stepped right over you, I could have killed Saul last night and you wouldn't have known until this morning. It's not my business to kill Saul. God put him on the throne. God will take him off. And he repeats three times to them on that occasion in chapter 26, verse 9. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? I mean, I'm, God anointed him. I'm not going to, to, to destroy him. 
Then he says in verse 11, but the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Verse 23, the Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. You may be trying to get rid of me because you're a master of your own situation, but I'm not trying to get rid of you because I'm not the master of mine. It's entrusted to somebody bigger than me. And God who anointed you and put you on the throne is the God who will take you off the throne in his time. You, Saul, are totally safe from me, though I understand I am unsafe to you. You're out to get me. Now, let me pause for a moment. When we started looking at David a few weeks ago, we began with that uh, phrase used of David. God said to Samuel, I'm looking for a man after my own heart. David was the least likely of the sons of Jesse. There were eight sons of Jesse from whose family this man was going to come. David was identified. And I said on that first occasion that every life has both its external and its internal journey, its physical journey and its soulish or spiritual journey inside. The external journey is about what happens to us. I get up in the morning, I have my breakfast, I go out to work, etc. That's the external journey. The internal journey is about what happens in us. Our thoughts, our feelings, our hearts, our disposition. And we have a lot of insight into both journeys in David's life. For his external journey, we actually have 59 chapters of what David did. 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Chronicles. David did this, and David did that, and David went there, and we can follow enough detail. You can make a movie about David's external life. But his internal life, with all its joys and its anxieties in equal measure, with all its victories and its sleepless nights, come to us in 75 of the 150 psalms. Half the psalms are attributed to David, and he probably wrote some of the ones that are not attributed. And also along the way, the writer pauses and gives us some insight into what is going on in David's heart. And a crucial aspect of this is in 1 Samuel 24 and verse 5, which I read earlier, where he said afterwards, this is after David had uh, cut a piece of robe out of Saul's cloak when he was in the cave. Afterwards, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. A crucially important aspect of David's heart is the tenderness of his conscience. He could have justified killing Saul in self-defense from a military, from a human point of view. He could have justified that. All his men wanted to get on and do it. But even just teasing Saul by cutting a piece of his robe and then shouting across to him when he was out of the cave that he'd cut this piece of the robe, even that left him conscience stricken for having cut off the corner of his robe. I'm going to come back to that. In the next chapter 25, there's an instant when David asked a man called Nabal, a man David had greatly helped in the past. Now he asked Nabal for some food and water for his men. Nabal was a landowner, employed a lot of men. Nabal refused. And in fact, he insulted David. And so David's men became set on revenge against Nabal. 
And someone told Nabal's wife, her name was Abigail, she immediately sent food and water and she pled with them not to attack Nabal and his men and here's the food, here's the water, here's what you're looking for, I'm giving it to you. And Abigail said to David in 1 Samuel 25, verse 29, even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my master, that is David there, the life of David will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. I love that phrase, that David, your life is bound securely in the bundle of the living because you're a man who does business with God and God has an agenda he's working out in your life. But, she said, the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. And when the Lord has done for David every good thing he promised concerning him, when he's appointed him leader over Israel, my master, that's David, will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed by having avenged himself. So here's Abigail's plea. David, don't go and attack Nabal for his insensitivity and his abuse of you. Because if you do, I know you well enough to know that you'll have on your conscience for the rest of your days that you'd needlessly avenge blood. And she immediately wins the argument when she appeals to his conscience. Many years later, towards the end of his life, David did a census to count his fighting men. God had told him not to. He did do so, and shortly afterwards, in 2 Samuel 24, verse 10, it says, David was conscience-stricken after he'd counted his fighting men. I don't think it's insignificant that three times the writer talks specifically about David's conscience. I looked through the Old Testament this week and found it interesting. The only other person whose conscience is ever referred to is Job. There's no reference to the conscience of Abraham, though, of course, he had one, and Moses and Isaiah, or any of these folks. But there's three times a reference to David's conscience because he was very aware of his conscience. A good conscience is vital to living well. There is a mental part of our minds that enables us to know facts. There is a moral part of our minds that enables us to distinguish right from wrong and good from bad in the light of the facts to determine how I behave. It's one thing to know the facts. It's an entirely different thing to know how to behave in the light of those facts. Before we engage in any action, we make a moral choice and we determine whether it's right and wrong and therefore we determine, not after the event, in advance of the event, whether it's good or bad, whether we engage in it or whether we don't. You know, we measure people's IQ, intelligence, quote, and I don't know if there's any way of measuring an MQ, moral quote, because David, I'm sure he had a high IQ, had a high MQ. He was conscientiously sensitive. We're born with a conscience. It's not just a matter of environment, although an environment can adjust and change our consciences because it's a very, very uh, uh, fragile thing. But in Romans 2.14, Paul says, Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required of the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. So Saul's case there in Romans 2 is that there's an inherent capacity with which we were born, whether you're Christian or not, whether you're Jew or Gentile, it's not relevant to this conscience this inherent capacity within us to know right from wrong. However, 
Scripture is also very clear that our conscience needs to be carefully maintained. It can be violated, it can be distorted, it can be desensitized. And Paul in 1 Timothy speaks of those who are holding on to faith and a good conscience because some have rejected these and they have shipwrecked their faith. You play fast and loose with your conscience. And the end result is going to be you shipwreck your faith. That's what happened to these men that Paul talks about. When we break our conscience in what may seem a small way, we may open what seems to be a gap in the door. But that has the potential to shipwreck our faith. Paul speaks also to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4 verse 2, of those whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They have desensitized their conscience. They're no longer driven by a moral guide. They're driven only by their perceived ability to manage the consequences. So my issue is not, is this right or wrong? My issue is, can I control it? And usually that means, can I hide it? And if I can get away with it, I have won. That's why the first symptom of a dishonest conscience is deceit, which leads to cover up which is all built on lies. We don't resist lying because lying is evil. If your conscience is seared, you resist lying because if you're found out, it'll get into trouble. You don't not steal because stealing is wrong if you have no conscience. You only steal because the consequences of being found out. But if there's no being found out, if I can pull the wool over people's eyes, I can sneak my way through this dishonesty, this stealing, this lying, whatever it may be. And my conscience is quite content with that. And David at this stage is demonstrating a good conscience. Now, he did later violate his conscience in several areas. I'm going to refer only to one because it's the easiest to refer to because it's the best known and it's the most obvious, it's the most blatant breaking of his conscience when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And I have no doubt that part of his processing over that issue was that it happens. It's no really big deal happening every night in Jerusalem. And in our day, we can look at issues such as that where the the normalizing of sexual relationships outside of marriage is such, we live in such an environment, we can engage very easily because it's what everybody does. And so the conscience that needs to be sensitive, maintained, is broken, whether it's in what the Bible calls fornication, which is premarital sex, whether it's adultery, which is extramarital sex, whether it's any other combination, the media bombards us with provocations, the physical lust, the internet gives us access to expressions of sexual behavior that become mainstream and subliminally, if we play around with them, confuse our own moral judgment. For a high-profile man like David, I am sure in his subconscious, he was aware that pulling women was a perk. High-profile, most important man in Israel. But once he had done that, he knew it was wrong. His conscience came alive again. He had to cover his tracks, and he covered his tracks through murder of the husband of Bathsheba, murder by proxy, sending him to the most dangerous part of the battle to get him killed, to make sure he was killed. And they lost the battle, and Joab, his commander, sent a message back. Bad news, we lost the battle. Good news. Bathsheba's husband is dead. Killed in the battle that we lost. Little by little, conscience is eroded. And little by little, along with conscience eroding, entitlement comes in. Do you know how you know when you've damaged your conscience? 
It's when you find it easy to do things today you would never have done 10 years ago or five years ago or 12 months ago. You see, the first time you violate something you know to be right, your conscience screams at you. It can keep you awake for a week. You probably confess it a thousand times to God. But the second time you do it, it's not quite so bad. You don't stay awake quite so long. The third time you do it, it's easier still. The fourth time you do it, you think, well, there's no real problem here. I wonder why there's such a fuss about this. The fifth time you do it, you start to be able to defend it. You can build a rationale in your own mind of defending it. The sixth time, you can actually encourage it, and you've rejected your conscience and shipwrecked your faith. And David, at this stage, when he was in the cave, had a tender conscience, but later, when he was in the palace, as king, seeing a beautiful woman on a neighboring building, and she catches his eye, and he seduces her, and she becomes pregnant with his child. She has to arrange the death of her husband, Uriah. What happened to the man of a tender conscience? How has he now become an adulterer? How has he now become a liar? How has he now become a murderer? I'll tell you what happened. In the cave, David was a fugitive. He was being hunted. He was an outcast. His self-awareness and his conscience is strong and it's humble. There's no entitlement on David's part now. And his conscience is alive. But years later, probably about 15 years later, he's in the palace in Jerusalem. Now he's king. Now his word ruled. Now people fawn over him. Now every whim is met for him. Now people serve him day and night. Very dangerous position to get into because his self-awareness and his conscience, which have been so acute in the cave, has now become distorted and deluded in the palace. And that's why when God in his grace enables us to be in a better situation than we were, whatever context of that betterness is, be very careful with the sense of entitlement that may come with it. And David recognized this later when he wrote Psalm 19. And the King James Bible in verse 13 of Psalm 19 says, Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Presumptuous sins are particularly evil. They're particularly dangerous. They say, I deserve this. It's presumption. I am different. I'm entitled. God understands me. The NIV translates that same verse. Keep your servant from willful sins that they may not rule over me. And to be presumptuous is to be willful. Presumptuous sins are willful sins. You're not a victim. You chose it. And in the previous verse of this psalm, he said, forgive my hidden faults. Those are the most dangerous. I've so glossed over them. And because they're hidden, I've felt a right to exercise them. I've kept them hidden in the back of my mind. Now they come out into the fall. Let me ask as I close, how sensitive is your conscience? Is it governed by the Spirit of God and the Word of God? Do you listen to it? Because if you cut one little corner, you will soon be cutting big corners. And David's answer is found in Psalm 51, which we're not going to look at. A man called Nathan came to David. 
told him the story of a man who had one sheep at home and somebody came and said, I need a rich man came and said, I need a sheep for my, I've got a banquet. Your sheep is a good looking sheep. I'm going to take your sheep, killed it and fed it to his guests. And this poor little man had only owned one sheep, was left devastated. The sheep was like a daughter to him, like a pet as well as, a, as raising it for meat. He told this story to David about this man in David's kingdom and David was angry and said, that man who took that man's one sheep, who had hundreds of his own, he must be punished. And Nathan looked at David, pointed his finger in his face and said, David, you are that man. You took the husband of Bathsheba and you slaughtered him on the battlefield to get what you want. And the sensitivity of David's conscience was this. So once he was confronted, he broke. He absolutely broke in repentance and remorse. And he writes Psalm 51 after that occasion, amongst other things, has created me a pure heart, O God, renew a steadfast or a right spirit within me. A man after God's own heart he was. It's now a corrupted heart. Create a clean heart in me. Not, not, not help me to deal with, oh, you know, I, I've got a problem with, with that. I know I'm, I'm prone to lust. I need some, some help with that. No, no, no. It goes right back to the source. It's my heart that needs to be purified. And then he says, don't cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. He had seen Saul, a man appointed by God. He'd seen the Spirit of God in Saul, but he had grieved him and the Spirit of God had left him. And he cries out, do not leave me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me and don't cast me from your presence. Instead, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. It's hard work. There's work in, in, in staying close to God, you know. And he says, give me that willing spirit to sustain me. It's, you don't just sit back and say, well, I hope it's going to happen. There's structure and discipline and work that has to be done. We're all nearer to falling than we probably realize. We are all vulnerable, all of us. He that thinks he stands, the New Testament says, take heed lest you fall. In fact, those of us who think we stand are probably the most vulnerable. I know people who joined with us in this congregation for years. They participate enthusiastically in worship, in the study of God's word. They got involved in service. And I know a number of people, it breaks my heart to know them because they're not here this morning. Do you know why? Because they have rejected their conscience and have shipwrecked their faith. As Paul warned against. I've had conversations with folks who have not shipwrecked their faith. They've just compromised in their conscience. But give them six months. Give them 12 months. And they'll be a million miles from God. They would have shipwrecked their faith. When with a ransomed in glory his face I at last shall see Oh, twill be my joy through the ages To sing of his love for me Oh, how marvelous Love for 